You're listening to Art Affairs, episode 30. Today I'll be doing a special year in wrap up with Andrew Hosner. So my name's Michael Faith, and this is a special 2020 wrap-up edition of Art Affairs. I'm happy to have Andrew Hosner from ThinkSpace back on the show, and my hope is that we'll be able to do one of these at the end of every year to, you know, sort of cap things off. Uh, but man, 20, <laughs> 2020, uh, what a year to start doing this. It's definitely a different kind of episode, and we talk about how the struggles of this year really affected the art community, how it affected ThinkSpace in particular, how they adapted to the ever-changing landscape, the gallery's brand new space, what 2021 looks like for them, and a whole lot more. So I hope you enjoy this special year-end chat with Andrew Hosner. Andrew, welcome back, man. It's, it's really good to have you back on. Oh, it's nice to be back on, man. It's... Uh... Cool to see how uh, big you've gotten in the last year. You've been busy with art affairs, and that's awesome. Oh, I appreciate it, um, and I definitely appreciate all of the support that that you've given to to me in the show for sure. Um, so, so we you know we had you on about a year ago, um, and at that time, I guess it was right after New Year's twenty twenty. Um, you know, I had all these extra topics that I had planned to talk to you about that we sort of ran out of time and didn't really get to. So I immediately floated the idea to you to have you back on to not only talk about those things, but also do a, a year end wrap up. Um, and at that time, I didn't really have a good sense of what a year end wrap up would even look like. Um, you know, this was pre pandemic. So my naive mind was like, well, you know, maybe we'll have some things to talk about, but I wasn't really sure what that looked like. And then 2020 happened. <laughs> <laughs> and now, like, I have an abundance of new things that I wanted to talk to you about. So Could have talked about Miami and this, that, and other thing <laughs> we were going to do in Hong Kong and then this cool thing we were going to do in Berlin. And, oh, wait, none of that happened. But now there's, like, all these other things, all these other, like, yeah, you know. it's crazy. Yeah, a lot of other stuff happened in the wake. But, yeah. For sure. And so I kind of wanted to start there with, like, COVID and, and how, you know, this entirely new world that we're now seeing ourselves in. Um, when, when this thing first started to really kick off in, in the States – which I guess was like around like March time frame um, for me. And I'm sure this was probably the, the case for a lot of people. I, I didn't really have a good sense of how long this was going to be. I certainly understood the importance of it and that we should be social distancing, wearing a mask. But it, I, when we were told to start working from home at like the office, I left food in the refrigerator because I was like, oh, it's just gonna be a couple of weeks where we kind of come together, bear down and like that would be it. But if I think back to how you reacted, at least like your public reaction, you were posting on Twitter, like, get ready, folks. Like, this is a, this is get ready for the long haul. Like, I, th I feel like you sort of had this sixth sense where you understood at least the impact to you and the gallery and the art scene a little bit better than, than most of the people that I saw. Um, so, I, you know, I first wanted to applaud you for your ability to sort of reposition the gallery um, to continue flowing kind of uninterrupted. But what was going through your head? And like, what did that process look like behind the scenes where you were first beginning to realize really the extent of this and not only the impact on you as a human, but also like the impact on your business and the gallery. No, it was, uh, I was talking about this just uh, recently with James Ballou, who was our last public show, um, which seems like a decade ago now. It's really fucking wild. Um, but like, look, like I love just watching like news outside the U S cause I know ultimately it just impacts us at some point, you know? Um, and I was following the stuff in China as early as like maybe third, fourth week of January. It was all over Twitter. And, you know, some people were paying attention to it and some weren't. And um, I was just curious. So I was, you know, I actually made it like a follow. So I was like keeping tabs on the news coming out and whatnot. And um, as we were getting ready to head over to uh, Pawa, Hawaii, which takes place every uh, year right around Valentine's Day, right around the 14th, everyone was starting to talk about it a little bit more. It had been in the ether then for about two, three weeks to people that were, you know, paying attention, like I said, on Twitter. And when we were over there, we were all, there was a, f a handful of us that were joking, like, you know, I wonder if this will be one of the last times we see each other for a while. And um, came back home 
and pretty much dove right into getting ready for James Blue's show, which I think, if memory serves me, I want to say opened on March 1st or 2nd. And um, James having also uh, having a podcast of, uh, excuse me, of his own with uh, Vantage Point, um, you know, definitely is friendly and, you know, close with a ton of artists. So when his show came to town, it was like one of the biggest kind of gatherings of uh, creatives and just people in general that we had had in probably about a year or so. It was a really amazing turnout. And looking back, it was kind of, a you know, so many people that I saw at the show that night, so many of us talk about how it was like the last time we really all saw each other or had like a gathering that might not be ever like that again, just since a lot of people are going to come out of this with uh, a much different take on crowds. Like I myself, I can't see ever going to a movie theater again. I've gotten too used to seeing them at home and then just the general notion of just sitting in a contained box, breathing a bunch of crap from other people. I mean, probably be rocking a mask for a long, long time. Um, You know, you look back and think that, you know, you would see tourists from, you know, different countries in Asia, you know, always wearing masks when they were over here. And you always kind of thought, well, you're just really kind of being overproductive. And now you're like, no, maybe you had your finger on the pulse. You know, it's like, yeah, I look back to like, going to just, you know, buffets and stuff like that. My skin crawls now thinking about it. Uh, um, obviously like concerts. Are, I mean, yeah. when you're in a big concerts, crowd I, of people. You know, I think, I think those can come back and you just got to be weary. But again, a lot of people probably still wear masks just to kind of be sure. safe, just because who knows what will uh, breed off of this. But in terms of just, uh, you know, once it really started hitting the fan and it was obvious that uh, we weren't going to be having public openings anymore, um, we've always been very kind of, uh, I guess you could say digital savvy or whatnot. Um, we've always done, you know, thanks to our good friend Birdman that's worked with us closely for a number of years now, we've always had a really strong documentation on the video front, um, of like our openings and installations, uh, artist interviews, um, studio visits, things of that nature. So we knew, um, that we just had to up the ante and make sure that we did every single show going into uh, COVID. And at the same time, um, I had seen a good number of uh, the virtual walkthroughs just on the uh, real realty side of things, having looked at some spaces uh, back in 2019 when we were thinking about originally moving and then just decided to put it on the back burner for a little bit. Um, and I thought, well, hell, let's look into that. And, um, you know, was talking to Birdman and, you know, the the equipment's not super cheap and obviously with a lot of his, you know, bread and butter just going by the wayside since he, you know, got the rug pulled out from under him too. Uh, like a lot of people did with COVID. He was like, I can't really afford to get that gear right now, man. So my wife and I talked and we were like, well, let's invest in this gear, give it to Birdman, let him, you know, basically work it off on events in the future, but enable him to start rocking things for us. And at the same time, give him another, you know, avenue to stay alive, um, during COVID as well and use us as a platform. And once he got a couple under his belt with us, every gallery in town started hitting him up for virtual walkthroughs. And now, you know, at the end of the day, it's been one of his best years yet because that's a pretty specialized skill and a lot of work. So you can charge a pretty good penny to do, you know, do it for other spaces. And he started doing it for some museums that we connected him with and even hooked up with a couple of realtors. So that's like ended up helping him out greatly and at the same time has enabled us to continue our program at full speed. And even, like I said, do the museum shows that we had planned that, I mean, both museums were pretty much not too sure about uh, doing the shows with us still, just because they knew probably neither of them were going to be uh, viewable to the public. And then we showed them what we had did with our space, with the virtual walkthroughs. And I think it just excited them to the moon. And now he's gotten three or four other museum gigs off us doing those museum shows with him because other museum shows, other museum institutions in town saw them. uh, And we're like, holy shit, we can still, you know, do a show and have a lot of people see it. And ultimately looking back on these past, probably eight months worth of shows that we've done now on a virtual spectrum, so many of them, and I've been talking to the artists about this are now being seen, you know, and you can prove it by the numbers, by thousands more people than they were when we were doing our normal thing back in 2019, because so many people obviously have a lot of time. And at the same time, we've grown our international market tenfold by, you know, doing our 
walkthroughs at around noon when there's so many other people that continue to do them at like six, seven o'clock at night. Like it's a regular thing. And it's like, you're only playing to your market at that point. You're on the web. When we go live at noon, we can pretty much hit all of our fans. You know, I think it's like 1 a.m. in Hong Kong at that point or not even, or it's a little later, but everywhere else it's still, you know, people can tune in and you're playing to a much more international market at that point, which is what the notion of doing something like that is all about. And, you know, when we're doing the walkthroughs, we got people commenting from just crazy places that are super stoked to see, see the gallery and see what we're doing and connect with us and talk. And, you know, and I think just be a part of a, you know, a movement is what this all is about, you know, so. Well, and I think that's one of the big, um, big components that I like the most. I mean, I, I live in Austin, right? So I, I never really get to partake in your opening nights on a normal you know, Saturday evening or whatever. But with these virtual like openings that you've been doing with LC, you know, kicking ass on the turntables and, and it, it almost feels like a party. Like everybody sort of evolved their own flavor of these virtual openings. And I think to your point, I think you all are unique because it, I think it's the closest to the feeling of what an actual opening, or like, a, you know, a traditional opening would be. Uh, so I guess how, how did you come up with that formula that you ended up going with for, for your own virtual openings? Yeah, I mean, because we're trying to do it, I guess, trifold. We, we've got the, you know, the nice proper video walkthrough that Bird films that's usually three to five minutes long. And we'll, you know, lay some artist audio over it to give it a little extra context and some nice beats that he does. And then we've got the virtual tour, which is the self-guided tour of the space that I was talking about earlier that we had to get his um, special supplies and camera and gear for. And then um, the live programming that we do on Instagram. Um, we just wanted to go into that with the notion of kind of how we treat our space in general, that it's not like, I mean, I, like you said, everyone's got their vibe and everyone's doing their different thing. And we feel we're getting the, you know, the proper kind of like what the artist wants to say through with, you know, the video tour and people can kind of walk the tour at their own space or walk the, sh- walk the exhibition or the show at their own pace with the virtual uh, walkthroughs. So, so with our live, you know, kind of Instagram walkthroughs or live uh, openings or whatever, we just wanted to have a generally loose vibe like our gallery. You know, we always have music playing during the during the week. Um, any given time you come in, there's going to be some hip hop or metal rock and and we just want people to feel at home when they come in. We usually just pop out and say, hey, enjoy the show. Hit us up if there's anything you want. And we leave it to be, you know, we're not like an automatic like car salesman mode or bugging them or, you know, just it's, it's best. Just That's how I like to enjoy a show. And that's how we always try to, you know, just make people, you know, it's not like a nod up, you know, search for Gucci and then look back down or whatever. Like a lot of blue chip galleries we actually like, you know, like I said, we do a soft little interaction. And then if people come to the back and want to talk to us or you know, we open up and chat and stuff. And so we just wanted the the vibes of these to just be kind of opening. And um, early on in COVID, we stopped it once people kind of got out of lockdown. But for the first three, four months, we were also doing the Friday happy hours where we'd go live at around like three o'clock in the afternoon, which was right around, you know, drinking time for everybody. And um, we'd have a, you know, a few glasses of wine and a blunt or whatever with everybody. And walk people through and LC was jamming and just, you know, that was really super loose. And as we started doing more and more live openings, we just kind of merged the two, I guess, and got a little bit more loose. I'll speak my mind, say what's up, um, talk about the orange dickhead, all that stuff. <laughs> and just, you know, it's, and I help people comment to me like, Oh my God, you're going to lose followers and this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, that's all ether. I mean, people put way too much weight on that shit these days. Um, and at the end of the day, if some, racist inbred moron somewhere isn't going to follow me anymore you know i mean all those people got to realize that 95 percent of the artists if not 96 97 percent of the artists that they like don't like him you know don't think like that aren't right. you know of that mindset so the fact that they'll then get uppity that <laughs> one of the people that they like or you know somebody like myself speaks up it's like it's like when those guys find out that Rage Against the Machine was singing against the <laughs> government and had a black guy in the band and they're like, what the fuck? I hate that band. I mean, when that call came about two, three months ago, I was crying. Tom Morello. Like, yeah. I think it was oh, Tom Morello, right? just epic. Yeah. Tom was talking about it, man, but it's just, it's, it's, <laughs> that, that's just epic. You know, it just shows you how fucking dumb they are. We just wanted to, uh, we just wanted to make it a fun vibe, man. We just wanted to make it a fun vibe, make people feel welcome. And at the same time, you know, if somebody wants to see another piece, we, 
you know, they'll comment. We'll go back and check it out. I mean, we've been keeping them to, you know, 40, 45 minutes whenever it feels right. And I don't know, anywhere from like 800 to 2,500 people tune in. I mean, it's not crazy, but it's fun. But between that and then the live, you know, video or the, the video walkthroughs getting three to 5,000 views and the virtuals getting right around that much traction. And then on top of everything else, I mean, it's, it's right around the eight to 12,000 mark of, you know, people that are seeing the shows now, just like actually viewing them walking through. Whereas before, you know, we'd get three, 400 people for an opening, a good one, you know, hundred, 200 for not maybe a hundred people throughout the month, you know, depending on the show. And then the video, uh, recaps of the openings would usually get a couple thousand views. Um, so by comparison, I mean, there's so many more eyes on the shows now. Um, it's crazy. And we've had a really, really strong year. One of our top two or three, um, you know, the dust hasn't settled yet and things are still, you know, going quite well considering, uh, everything, but we've done a lot of, did a lot of fundraisers this year. Um, did a lot of like inventory sales to help our artists out where we incurred the discount and things of that nature. Um, things that some people questioned and this, that, and the other thing, but in hindsight, I'm glad we did it. We helped a lot of people out that wouldn't have sold work. Otherwise we raised about 110 K total between, uh, benefits that we did for black lives matter and the Australian fires and COVID relief here locally. Um, so, I mean, we definitely did our part and at the same time tried to, uh, you know, keep things active and entertaining and exciting on our programming front, as well as doing a number of contests this past year, which gave a lot of people, you know, a nice distraction and hope and, you know, something to work towards and, you know, new little communities developed out of it. And that otter contest we did, that's still one of the favorite things I've ever done in my life. I mean, it was just so much fun and everyone had so much fun with it. Well, and I was going to ask you about that because that, that, that was just after things kicked, kicked off. It was like a month after or whatever. And everybody was rightfully so like losing their mind, trying to figure out what their new normal was. Climbing the walls, yeah. Right? And you introduced this sort of fun contest that, you know, ended up being a great distraction for people. And I think people really embraced that and, and really dove into the fun of that. So how did you first get that idea to, to really push that out? Um, We were just sitting around one day, my wife and I, just and Otter was being Otter, our big fat man, Coon <laughs> Cat. He's like 12 pounds a beast. I think he was like 14 at that point. We put him on a little uh, diet, this COVID, and he's down to 12 pounds now. But anyways, uh, he's a monster of a Maine Coon, and he was just being himself in a box. And I took a photo of it, and I joked with Sean. I'm like, oh, it'd be funny to see people do this. And she's like, we should do something fun. And we started riffing about it. And um, I just said, fuck it. And I think like maybe an hour later, after uh, getting a little... Uh, I guess, uh, herbal influence in me. I decided to, uh, <laughs> put together the contest and, uh, I honestly thought we'd get like, you know, 30, 40, 50 people. I, I, I just didn't know what would happen. Um, the fact that, I mean, I, I still have people that do do it and will tag me and like, I know it's way past, but I s came across this and I loved it. And I just wanted to share it with you. I just think it, it warms my heart. I, I get emotional about it because it's just amazing. I mean, that, that, our lovable fat cat brought like over a thousand people together. And, um, you know, we ended up finding some really amazing artists out of the batch, not to mention a lot of our artists that are like super established, just did it for fun, you know, didn't have anything to gain from it other than just having fun with it. And, um, and the hashtag for it became like this own little community where people were sharing stuff and it was wild. And so many people, I mean, I think we own now probably, 20 portraits of our cat because i mean we ended up buying a couple that were so amazing and then so many people just sent them to us as gifts that uh it was just super super touching and we love our cat to death so it's nice to have all that stuff of him you know when he's gone and um it was just awesome and then that led to the, the happy place contest which uh was huge too and still to this day is a hashtag that just continues to grow and grow and grow and a lot of those guys are going to be in a group show coming up uh, in the spring at the space um, per their uh, winning, uh, you know, contributions to the show and stuff. And uh, it was just, uh, I don't know, it was just uh, something different, you know, and yeah. it wasn't all about making money. It was about the community that we've done so much work 
over the last four or five years with our traveling LAX series of shows to, uh, to bring to light, to make people aware of that, um, you know, it's definitely the biggest movement, uh, ever in art history, you know, especially when you, and granted, I mean, graffiti is probably bigger, but it's also a part of this right. new contemporary, you know, it's all been melded together. So, I mean, everything's disputable, but I mean, it's definitely one of for sure. Um, I mean, it's longest running continues to grow at a international level, bigger and bigger and bigger. And the bigger we get, the more, I guess, just full on contemporary we get, um, especially with the new space and, um, the new programming vision and stuff, but we'll always be new contemporary no matter what, because it's just, it's a special little, you know, bubble of the art world that I hold dear to my heart. And you mentioned the um, the sales that you were doing right at the beginning, especially um, where you 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 guys were effectively taking the cut, and in a hundred percent of the artist's original you know percentage was still being fulfilled, um, which is a fantastic thing to do because obviously the you know the art and any time these you have these widespread periods of of financial hardship, I feel like the art community gets hit pretty hard usually, um, and and I. I feel like you jumped right on that to try to help artists continue to be, um, you know, have have a source of income. And, you know, you mentioned earlier that you guys have had one of your most successful years, which I think is pretty incredible. And I think speaks a lot to the way that you sort of repositioned yourself. Um, I guess, why do you think this time was different where, you know, you know, we had the, the housing crisis back in 2008 or whatever we have. We've had several recessions, um, and those have tended to have a really large impact on the art community. But why is this event uh, changed to where you guys are actually still being profitable and still selling out shows? Uh, that's a hard one to put a finger on. I mean, I think a lot of people that collect art are probably not as affected by it as your average, you know, blue collar, you know, weekly salaried person that are really getting hit the hardest with all this due to our government's complete ineptness and inability to uh, provide, um, you know, compensation checks like every other, you know, civilized country on the planet. So that helps, I think. At the same time, I think everyone just being inside all the time um, is definitely helped. No one has any outlet for uh, visual stimulation, really, you can't go to museums, you can't really go to art shows anymore. So I think people are, uh, you know, attracted to, I guess, people making noise online in the art world, and we've been making a lot of noise, so to speak. Um, when we did the sale, I mean, that brought a whole lot of attention to us. I think we sold like 111 or 112 pieces, I'd have to double check, but north of 100 pieces over the... Uh, the month period that we did the 25% off campaign. And we had some pretty vocal people out there that thought we were, you know, destroying these artists markets and stuff like that. And I contested each one of them via DM. And I was like, I don't think that's the case at all. People aren't stupid. That, you know, very widely noted what I'm doing. None of these artists are at Christie's level yet. So it's not like I'm hurting an auction market or a resale market and they're all hurting. They're all freaking out. They don't know what to do next. A lot of these artists don't have shops. A lot of these artists don't have a print market. Right. If I can sell something that's maybe been sitting in our inventory three, six, nine months or a year, because people will tend to leave things with us for a while because we have a really active web shop, why the fuck not? And if we can make 25% on something that's just there as opposed to no percent, and at the same time help a creative continue to be a creative... You know, at the end of the day, La Luz, you know, a Vertical and some other galleries that I really uh, respect and work with quite a bit and, you know, collect from, you know, followed suit as well did some other creatives just starting to do things on uh, sales of their own. And um, we were able to sell, you know, some really large works and send some artists, you know, five, six, seven thousand dollar checks in the middle of a you know, pandemic. And they were like, holy fuck. Yeah, that's great. I had a couple people call me out crying, you know, it was awesome. No, I, and I remember when, you know, I had touched base with you like a month in or whatever, and just asking how, how business was going and things. I, I remember distinctly, you said, yeah, you know, Sean and I had a good cry over dinner last night, just talking about it, you know, just because of how the community sort of showed up for you guys, which I, I think speaks a lot to how engaged you are with the community and, and how much, uh, you know, you respect and work for the artists that you that you have. 
Totally. Um, what's I mean, with all these new forms of engagement that, that we talked about earlier with the, the, the live openings and, you know, the, the Birdman uh, tours that, you know, the walkthrough tours, do you, th- I mean, I guess, will these continue even after in-person events come back or are some of these things now, now like permanent parts of your, of your operation? Permanent. 100% permanent. Yeah. Um, we, you know, even for a super A show that we just did, I mean, we were able to have like uh, just north of about a hundred people out throughout the course of the seven hours that we were open on the first day, just because we tiered the visitation and the new spaces, you know, like almost 5,000 square feet. So we have like uh, three groups of four at a time over, you know, 20 minutes. So, I mean, we were able to get a good number of people through. It felt comfortable. You know, the staff, our staff was in the back behind the new big steel door. You know, my wife and I were out with our masks and welcoming people. Everybody that came through was, you know, doing what you should do, just rocking a mask and being civil and um, keeping distant, checking out the shows and getting out of there. But we still, you know, went live right before. We still had uh, Bird do his, uh, you know, video tour, which we just launched. The virtual tour will be done, uh, I think, in debuting on Monday for this one. Uh, it took a little extra time just because he uh, had to get used to the new uh, space and uh, new editing that we had to do just because it's a much bigger space and there's a lot more that Birdman had to do on the back end. But uh, moving ahead, uh, that's definitely still the plan and we'll still do the uh, the virtual uh, studio tours with the artists. I mean, in the past, I would always do a studio tour with this, if uh, the artist is local or if I was just lucky enough to somewhere, you know, be going through their studio in the five, six months before the show. But going into COVID, um, this is something we adapted right away too. I just thought, well, why the hell can't I just ask the artist to film a bunch of miscellaneous B-roll over a month or two period? They don't have to be, you know, you know, this amazing director, just get me a bunch of good B-roll, get it, get it to me at, you know, horizontal format and then record, you know, like a couple different audio tracks, like a longer one that we'll put on the, uh, your uh, studio visit and then a shorter one that we lay over the uh, walkthroughs of the uh, exhibitions that we were talking about earlier. And um, everyone started doing it. And then I'll just, I'll just give it to bird and he kind of works his editing magic and puts together something pretty rad and throws some music over it. And they've been coming out great and they've been getting anywhere from three to 6,000 views every time um, just on Instagram, not to mention like a, a good chunk on YouTube and a good chunk on Facebook and a good chunk on Twitter. So, I mean, upwards of, you know, on average five to 8,000 views in total, which is a lot of, a, you know, good additional exposure. And um, we're going to definitely continue to do those because I myself nice. love them. I love, I mean, that's why I do this. I love to see into the minds of a creative and the more that you can expose their vision without, I guess, directing a person's perception of their work. Cause everyone wants you to be able to read into things. I think the better educated our, you know, patrons can be in their buying habits and knowing why we work with an artist, because sometimes it's hard to convey, you know, why we work with somebody until you really get into their heads and understand, you know, what it is that we see, what it is that we love about them and what we can see them being in three to five years, you know, a decade right. from now, you know, I mean, some of the artists we work with right now are amazing, but I know what they're going to be in three to five years, a decade from now. And it's exciting, you know, and if they're working with us still amazing, you know, that's a plus. But if we helped them to just be still creating in 10 years, that's also a plus and to be a part of their story. Um, earlier on, it sucked when someone left. Now I get it. You know, everyone's got to keep growing. Um, just like on the corporate ladder of a regular gig, I guess. So, um, but now we're getting to the point, especially with the new space to where, you know, we're making it very obvious that we're in it to win it that we're not fucking around and that we want to really present our artists on a, uh, on the next level in a blue chip type setting without the blue chip type bullshit. Yeah. That's so, so that's interesting. I wanted to talk to you about that when, um, you know, the December shows, you know, you you mentioned the fact that that was the first time you really kind of opened back up to the public, but it was also the first show that you've had in your new space. And when we talked around this time last year, that was one of the things that you said was coming in 2020 was your 4.0, you know, iteration of think space. Um, so tell me about the new gallery. What's, uh, you know, what's the space like, how are you breaking it up? Like what, what's going into that? Oh no, for sure. Um, uh, like when we spoke, I think the plan was that we were going to start looking for a space, you know, probably a month or two after and definitely move at the end of the year. And then COVID hit. 
Yeah. And uh, we kind of had a talk and we were like, you know what, let's wait. Let's talk to the owner of our building, at, you know, the, the Culver City spot, which we just left, and see if we can get another year at least just, and just keep it simple. And um, when we went to talk to them, we found out that uh, they were about to tell us that uh, they were selling the building and the new tenant was probably going to like almost double our rent, like it was happening to a lot of people in Culver City. And um, we were like, well, fuck that. So I had my eyes on a couple stretches of, uh, I guess, uh, areas of, uh, you know, retail, so to speak, or just storefronts, warehouse areas in L.A. that I wanted to, to move to if we ever did. So we basically just went out one afternoon and just drove around these areas, found a few that we wanted to look into. And um, this is one of the, like the handful that we looked at. And as soon as we walked into the space, I just could see what we could do to it. Um, it's an old warehouse space built in 1955. Um, it's 4,500 square feet with like a thousand foot, uh, enclosed back area that, um, we're turning into a nice little chill area for our, uh, for our staff. And at the same time, like, you know, VIP hangouts after the openings and stuff like that. And there's a killer mural by, um, the Perez bros that they did of our staff, nice. all of us kind of checking out their dad's, uh, 61, uh, gem um at a parking lot out in the valley and um it came out just killer and it's just a really nice like nod to our longtime crew um to kind of be there and it's funny how many people will walk back there and just like trip out on it that have been to the space so far and um the new space was all about having a really big back room since we do a lot of museum shows and had a, a lot more museum shows ahead in uh 22 23 and uh, 24 even a couple in 21 at the end of the year if uh everything stays on track for uh getting back to you know whatever the new normal is but um we wanted to just have a back room to where we could really uh throw down and have everything ready at any given second and easy easily accessible a lot of room for our crew to ship and you know uh, unstretch canvases and do whatever they needed to do without being uh you know having them just move shit around too much and have things be in the way and at the same time have the new space be you know that next step up in a totally different presentation. Cause every time we've moved, every time we've gotten into a new gallery, we've always gone for a different vibe and a different kind of, uh, presentation. And the last one was all about, you know, coziness and warmth. And, you know, we even had like a lighter, I think it was Swiss coffee on the walls instead of bright white and, you know, different lighting spectrum. And, you know, we were, you know, the natural wood ceiling and the dark floors and stuff. And in this one, we wanted to have a complete basically opposite of that. And at the same time, I've always wanted a warehouse space. My wife loves the big arch ceilings of the old warehouses. We wanted to find one that had skylights. We wanted to have one that we could really make our own. So when we came into this, it was just bare bones. It was perfect. And um, I think the main exhibition space is about right around like 1,800 square feet, give or take. Um, and then Gallery 2 is uh, about twice the size of our old project space. So um, we're able to... Uh, give the artists in uh, gallery to a much nicer uh, room to rock in now. At the same time, um, we have that gallery now situated at the front um, and it welcomes the patrons instead of in the back. So it's not an afterthought. And then they get to kind of check out the first show, say hi to Ken in the office, you know, sign up for the mailing list, whatever, get the new postcards and some stickers and some buttons. And then, you know, kind of go around to the corner into the expanse of the main space and kind of be wowed and, check things out and it's just nice to kind of have like just that next level of uh presentation that we were going for and we got these brand new leds that are uh, kind of state of the art with um brand new ac that's like super silent polish the floor to like the extremes of shininess and um just wanted to kind of just uh I mean, it's a good bit bigger than the old space, but at the same time, we're telling every artist that's on the uh, program for 21 already that was a little freaked out that we're not looking for a lot more work. We're just looking to present it at the next level. Um, we got really lucky due to COVID that the price of the place is not much different than where we were, but we get a lot more bang for our buck. We're a lot more centrally located. We're in an exciting new part of town that's got restaurants and other galleries and breweries popping up uh, party beer companies right next to us we're going to be doing some exciting things with them in 2021 highly likely which is a uh, amazing new cafes across the street we're going to be doing some cool things with them the l stop for the train is like right around the corner um you know the tens right around the corner i mean it's just one of those like 
really beautifully located neighborhoods when it comes to knowing how people in LA kind of get around and, uh, or don't get around, so to speak in certain parts. So it's <laughs> really well located. Um, it's only 2.2 miles from our, uh, old location in color city. And, um, it's roughly just about two and a half times the size of the old space. And, um, we're super, super excited. Um, the walls are 12 feet high. The ceilings are 20 feet tall. It just is a wow factor when you walk in, and it really presents the art in a uh, whole other level. Nice, nice. Um, are you organizing the space a bit differently than before? I noticed in the copy for your December shows, instead of main room and project room, it was gallery one, gallery two. Was that more of a conscious decision to distinguish those differently? We just wanted to have a different vibe. Um, it, it's, the space is set up differently, um, and at the same time, the people that were programming into uh, twenty one, twenty two, and beyond for the uh, for gallery two project room always kind of had the connotations of like a testing type grounds. And and it was in a way, and we're going to try to up the ante a little bit. Um, and that's also why gallery two is at the front now. Um, cause a lot of people would come in, see the main show and leave. We noticed I wouldn't even venture into the back maybe for fear of, you know, interacting with staff since some people are weirded out by that. Not even, I mean, this is, Pre-COVID, I think just some people just don't like any interaction when they go to a gallery. And I get that, you know, I think they think if they go near the sales desk that you're going to get pitched. And we noticed that would keep people out of uh, the second show sometimes. So um, we wanted to have a little bit of a different flow with this space. Nice. Well, I, I'm, I for one, am excited to come visit whenever it's safe to, to make that trip out there. And, you know, clearly ThinkSpace has evolved quite a bit over the years. This is your now fourth iteration. Um, I guess, how do you see it continuing to evolve? Do you have like any big bucket list goals that, that you want to accomplish in the next five to 10 years? We, we've got a six plus three lease, they call it. So we've got up to nine years in, in the current space. That's why we uh, invested uh, close to six figures in the build out and making sure everything was really, you know, perfect and as we wanted it and as we always dreamed of in our, uh, you know, kind of uh, perfect vision space, so to speak. Um don't see getting any bigger than this. Um, we'll, we'll all be, uh, in our young sixties at the end of the nine year lease. So we'll see where we want to go from there. We'll see where the world's at. We'll see where, uh, just the world of art too is at. Um, since obviously, you know, so many things continue to change at warp speed, right. but we're going to try to continue to, uh, you know, be one of the, uh, hopefully be one of the forerunners like we are now and, you know, be sure that we're keeping on top of things like that. We uh, continue to not work with Artsy. I don't see the need in it myself. I know a lot of people will do. Maybe we will. Um, it seems to be the one thing we're not doing that everybody does. But at the same time, we've never tried to do what everyone else does. And it's always uh, seemed to work for us. If uh, nothing else, we do that. And then a lot of people follow suit. Um, though they'd never probably give a tip of the hat. And that's fine, whatever. But uh, in terms of bucket goals and stuff, uh, bucket lists and stuff like that, uh, personally would love to do a museum show in Europe of some kind that I get to have a hand in the curation of, even though obviously we've done that with urban nation, but, uh, I guess that was kind of our baby, um, that we were involved in the birthing of and stuff, um, to a, to a small degree with a uh, Yasha, obviously being the main charger there, but you know what I mean? Just like a, you know, some rad little, you know, museum somewhere that just wants to get the, uh, the LA vibe, so to speak, I would love to, that would be an honor. Um, we're going to be working with some Hong Kong fairs coming up in 22 and 23. That was definitely on the list. We've done some curated shows at, uh, smaller galleries there, but I definitely want to take our artists over and kind of have them, uh, play with the big boys at, uh, one of the fairs there. So that's in the works and just more solo shows for some of the artists that we've worked with for a long time on the museum level. Um, we've got a couple, um, coming up in 21 and 22 that I'm super excited about and um, don't want to nix them just yet. And um, the end of 2021, we actually have a museum show that is going to be uh, massive that we're working with, with a super established artist that I've been friendly with and nice. close to for a while via powwow, but we've just never had a chance to work with together. And um, when the opportunity presented itself, uh, we had a pretty good meeting and uh, it's going to be an exciting show. So awesome. I'm looking forward to that and um, some other things that are cooking. And um, I think 22 or 23, a show that I've been pitching to museums for probably about four or five years now, finally got picked up by one. And um, it was supposed to be 
March 21, but thanks to COVID, we all thought that it wasn't too wise to try to bring 12 artists in from around the world, and, <laughs> you know, into Midwest and try to get this happening. So we've, uh, we've pushed it back to, I think, spring or summer 22. I'm waiting for the dust to settle on their 21 exhibition program to know exactly when, but, um, when that show happens, I think it's going to be, uh, pretty amazing. I don't even want to say anything else about it just because it's one of those ideas that I think is pretty damn awesome if I don't say so myself. Um, so does the museum and um, working in tandem. It's a co-curation between myself and the museum's director. And um, I think it's going to be pretty, pretty neat to see it all come to life. Very cool. That's exciting. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about another, another thing that really impressed me about how you reacted to you know, some of the many harrowing events of, of 2020. Um, and, and, you know, following the, you know, the murder of George Floyd in, in the streets of Minneapolis, I, I feel like we saw an explosion of social activism in this country and, and really around the world that was certainly bigger than any that I've seen in my lifetime, uh, which it, that in and of itself was pretty remarkable. It's, it's an absolute tragedy that it took what happened to him to cause that uprising um, but on the glasses half full side of things, I feel like, um, you know, it's a hell of a lot of people woke up and I think that's a good thing. Um, and, and it really motivated people to stand up and say, no, you know, this is not right. This is not who we are. Um, the kind of systemic social racism and constructs of oppression um, that are the underbelly of our country. Uh, we're not going to take that anymore. Right. We need to do something about it. And you touched on it earlier. How you've always been very outspoken about these things and you face them head on and really stand up and speak your mind, um, not really taking into to consideration, you know, the, the people who might unfollow you or whatever. Right. And, and I think that I really embrace that. and I really appreciate that because at some point silence is complicit, right? At some point, if you stay silent long enough, you're part of the problem, right? And so silence is violence, as it became a saying during all this, isn't it? And it is. You have to speak up. You have to say your mind. You have to use your platform. I don't think we've regained our same number of views on our stories since that, because we've been so like blackballed by fucking that douchebag that runs fucking Instagram and Facebook, fucking the Moon Boy. That guy's like. Someone should take him out more than Trump. I mean, he is the biggest cancer on this planet next to Bezos. I mean, it's, it's abs absolutely insane the influence that douchebag has. And anybody that was speaking out on BLM since has never regained the same. Really? Oh, God. I, I talked to so many people that were vocal about it. I mean, and we continue oh, to man. put something up at least every few days, you know, to make sure that people know that it wasn't just a fad. At, and at the same time, nothing's gotten better at all. Right, right. You know, and um, I mean, small minutias here and there in a few cities, but I mean, minutias. But yeah, I mean, I mean, like uh, anything we put up before in stories would be like in the three to 5,000 range uh, of views, which is so low. I mean, which is still just utter, you know, blackballing compared to like a year ago, it'd be like 10 to 20,000 views. Right. Now it's like if we break, you know, uh, that number, it's rare. Um, and it's ebbs and flows, but I can tell like the day after I'll put something up, it goes back down to like under a thousand. And then it takes me like a week to kind of crawl back up to get out from under, you know, the thumb of, you know, social oppression, socialism oppression on the, you know, social net oppression, I should say. So right, right. it's just wild. It's obviously in their metrics. Um, they don't want people to see it. They don't want people to be influenced by people that, you know, have a platform that have a voice. And, um, early on, we just decided to, you know, get right on board, speak our mind. We did that print with Kayla Mahaffey from Chicago that just, you know, ra raised like north of 80K for, you know, BLM and the ACLU and, um, and, and, and continue to just really get our voice out. I mean, um, it's important to me. Um, my partner in the gallery, LC, is, you know, a person of color, our longstanding, I think nine, 10 years now, director, Ken Fluhollen is a person of color. Um, everybody that works for us is, you know, a, a minority. Most of the artists we work with are, it's just one of the things that just to me is, I just wasn't raised like that. I just, right. you know, a friend was a friend. I didn't have a black friend. I didn't have a Mexican friend. I didn't have an Asian friend. I mean, it, it's it's what it, we're all people you know and we all have the same skeleton underneath us you know and we all have the same blood running through our veins and it was just important to us to speak up and we lost a ton of people a ton like thousands 
And then when that shit with, uh, I can't even remember the douchebag's name, that artist out of Texas that decided to get vocal and I decided to take him on. I don't, I don't remember. That was that. hilarious. <laughs> um, yeah, that was hilarious. I can't even think of his name right now. What, what, what was he saying? Was it just like Colin your name Schiller, sort of thing? I think, or something like that? Ah, uh, it's not worth getting into and giving okay. him any more time a day. I mean, he just decided to go all white power one day on his feed. And I went into the comments and I brought it to the attention of a bunch of people that supported him, like juxtaposed and stuff. And, uh, he's since become like this, like poster boy for, you know, the white, right? Yeah, exactly. Whatever the hell you want to call him. The, the proud boys of the world. Ugh. No, that's, that's disgusting. And I, mean, I guess, how did you, um, I guess have the, the confidence to really take that risk on, um, from a business perspective, because I mean, I, I think, you know, yeah, we got some interesting DMs. Let me tell you. <laughs> well, and, but I think it also has the potential to benefit as well. Like I, th- I think, as many people as you might have lost, I feel like, at least from my perspective, it makes me want to f- to support and appreciate you guys even more because you know I see how much risk that that took, and and how you had the confidence to overcome that risk makes me appreciate those actions and, and words even more. And I hope that there's more people like that out there. You know. No, I appreciate that. And I think a lot of artists that we work with like would realize that I mean, I, I there was numerous times where I would do a post like, Is have you seen your favorite artist or gallery speak up? Because, I mean, I'm sorry, if you got a platform, fucking speak up. And if you don't, your your silence is you know, you're part of the problem, like I was saying. So I think like you like like you said, and I mean it was never our intent to to use it in any kind of positive format. We just wanted to make sure that people knew what the fuck was going on, but as it grew and grew and more and more people started waking up to the fact, I think more people respected people that had been there and were saying their true voice and weren't like hopping on the bandwagon after the fact, right. um, which was at the end of the day, I mean, you can't even say that's a bad thing because the more people that spoke up, the better. And if it took you longer to wake up, oh, well, at least you woke up sure. and at least you started sharing. So, I mean, I no, no hate there, but uh, it, it, was, it was just important us to make sure that people knew our stance um, because there was too many people that really weren't saying anything, not to mention the history of, you know, things on the museum level, which was also, you know, brought to super, super light. You know, there's so many like great things that have come out of this. And I think there's a lot of change that's going to be happening over the, uh, over the year or two ahead, especially at the institutional level. As, as far as the, the various, you know, charity related sales that you've had, do you, do you f- think that that sort of philanthropy will continue to be a part of what you do going forward? We've always done stuff like that. We've always done, you know, lots of fundraising each year for born free. Cause I've always kind of joked that I'd sooner save an animal than a person. And <laughs> that kind of rings truer than not this year, more than any, there's many a person that I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't bother to save, but, uh, I'd go out of my way to save a squirrel, so to speak. But, uh, um, so we've, we've, we've done ton. We've raised, I mean, I think North of a quarter million over the years, cause we've done like so much with born free over the last 10 years. I mean, we've donated a ton to them. We've donated a ton to, um, various other charities that have, you know, popped up over the years. We've done a lot with, um, I'm just trying to think. I mean, just so, so much over the years. Um, but no, it, it won't stop. I mean, we definitely, you know, feel that it's important to, to do that. Um, you know, especially when, you know, something comes up that needs, you know, attention and needs some support from the creative uh, community. And, uh, it's just something that my parents always did. My, uh, my mom's boss, Orion, the guy that I looked up to back when I was a kid, he used to do a lot of it. So I guess, uh, I don't know. And my wife loves that we do it. And um, so it's just one of those that she's always done. I mean, today she's at a food bank that she volunteers at for the last many months during COVID. And, um, you know, she handles the food lines around L.A. And it's, I think last week, like 1,900 people came through for food, um, she told me, which was uh, amazing. And at the same time, just sad. Speaks a lot to the priorities in this country. That that many people. I mean, in the heart of, I mean, like over in Venice where it's not like a bad off place, but still people are broke and need food. Yeah, it's it's wild to me that that's like that here. Um, it's just fucked. And this past year has just brought to light that type of, you know, civic involvement is needed, you know, um, especially if you've got a, a nice platform and we've got, you know, not that if, 
everybody's tuning in like we were just joking about. But I mean, we've got a, a, a good breadth of followers between all of our social networks, not to mention our pretty healthy, you know, mailing list ourselves and a lot of traffic on our website. So, uh, and our blog. So, I mean, we're able to, uh, you know, say our piece and have it, uh, have it be felt I've noticed. And that's, you know, something that's good. And, um, I I'd say on average, we probably donate at least 50,000 a year to different things due to everything, little things we do and whatnot. But this past year, like I said, it was definitely one of our bigger years where we've donated, you know, north of six figures. But um, it was important to do that, I think. But it's definitely something that I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for and, and appreciate. And I, I'm sure there's other people out there that, that feel the same. Um, one of the things that I had queued up to talk to you about last year that we didn't really have of time for um, was to talk to you about or get an understanding of what the typical journey a gallery show takes from start to opening night. Because, you know, we re- on, the, on the other side of it, we really only see, we only start to see it at the very end when everything's ready to go. Um, but I, I know that there's a ton of pre-work that really goes into that and organizing that leads up to the opening of a show. So, like, for instance, a solo exhibition, how far out do you start really talking to an artist about a show? And, and if we want to take an example like Super A's show, for instance, how, how far in advance of the opening night do you start having those conversations it's case by case but usually never less than you know 12 to 18 months out for a solo but with super ace case it was part of uh kind of like we came to him with like a like a like a five-year plan like how's this look i mean it's just somebody that we really believed could could take off like the base was there it just needed a, a bigger can of gas getting poured on it so to speak and um and this show's been on the books for probably about two and a half years, and he's been working on it, you know, for give or take a year. But usually at least a year, um, year and a half, I'd say oftentimes two. Um, we're scheduling out 22 and 23 right now pretty aggressively. Um, our 21's fully booked. And then, you know, like I said, starting to work on a couple of uh, museum shows for 23 and 24 that are a ways off. But museums work out, work three to five years out usually. And, you know, any artist that, you know, really has, you know, the demand and things going strong for them usually are booked a couple years out, too. So that's usually kind of where you're working with. But in terms of like when things really start going to that next level, it's usually six to months to a year out, depending on, you know, whether it's a, you know, main gallery, gallery one, you know, gallery two type show, how much work's going to be needed. And just, you know, if the artist is working in oils or, you know, he's looser, he's detailed, he's hyper realist, sure. that type of thing. So it's it's always a case by case. But I mean, once you're six months out, that's when things are you like, you know, making sure that you've got a few works ready. Let me see them. Um, start talking to them about vibe of the show, what they want to say, if anything, with the PR. Um, start talking about travel, shipping, getting get get. And then like three months out, you start figuring out like the show title, getting things ready for press, you know, things of that nature. So when you first put it on the schedule a couple years out, um, is it just putting a a name down and you don't really have a good idea of what the show is going to end up being? Or do you have a sense of what the theme is going to be that far in advance? Not usually that far out. No, it's just knowing that uh, it's either an artist that we're already working with and it's just the next stage and, you know, their creative development with us. Or it's an artist that uh, we've had an eye on and, you know, know that everything that they've done in the past year, I, you know, slap my grandma to own um that i like it so much so i definitely trust that they're just going to get better i can only think of a couple instances in the entire 15 years we've worked where things changed enough in the year and a half or so to where when we got the show i was like oh that's not quite what i was expecting but um but i came around to it and the show still did well you know so i mean it's not worth naming names or anything like that obviously but i mean it's only every once in a while has it uh like i said only a couple instances in uh 15 years to where it didn't really i guess uh, pan out exactly as i had envisioned but uh more often than not um it's just knowing that the uh artist has a good work ethic and you know the chops to really crush and just keeping in touch with them and making sure that they know that we're going to make the show all it can be so we hope that they do too do do they tend to come to you with an idea for a show and say, hey, put me on the calendar, coach? Or do you tend to come out and reach out to artists that, that you are looking for uh, working with to you know, see if they're interested in having a show with you? Mm. 
I'd say it's like 60, 40, 70, 30 on the greater percentage us reaching out. Um, with the new space, it's funny when we debuted it, how many people hit me up within like the first, uh, couple weeks of the images getting out there that were like, Hey, that I just never <laughs> thought of showing. So that was nice. It was cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, I wish there was enough time in the day to show everybody that we like and, you know, support and are friends with. Unfortunately, uh, we're actually cutting back a little bit as, a, as we've discussed on, you know, the focus and stuff as we go into, uh, 21 and 22 and beyond. Um, not to mention introducing some really amazing new uh, talent coming up in 21 that we're uh, excited about, like, you know, solo shows with artists that we've, you know, never really shown before or have only shown in one or two group shows to kind of, you know, get to know each other first. But um, super, super excited. How does the theme usually come together? Is that usually something that the artist kind of does on their own or do you work with them to, to propose a theme and kind of go back and forth? Or uh, I've only planted a theme in a couple people's minds before. Like Scott Listfield actually was pretty... Uh, uh, vocal about like how we kind of dreamt up the last show and some other ones and stuff. Um, but more often than not, um, no, I, I like people to do what they want to do. That's also why we've kind of strayed away from theme shows over the years. Um, there's galleries in town that'll be like, Hey, you know, this does well, do like a bunch of this, or, you know, this artist does really well for us. Paint like this. I mean, I've heard it from artists and it's, uh, I get it. I mean, I, and, and if it helps you guarantee some sales, I guess that's not a bad thing. It's just not my gig. It's just not my, you know, our flow or vibe, what have you. Well, I, I think that's smart because I, I mean, my perception as a collector is uh, an artist's work is that is so much better when they have a personal investment in what they're working on. When they're excited and passionate about the thing that they're working on, then their art shows. I mean, the, the work shows uh, that much better. So if they're not and it's something that they feel like they're kind of forced into because of uh, of a, a market or whatever that they're trying to, to, to keep, then I think it's going to take a toll on the work, right? A hundred percent. Like an artist I know you collect and love um, and that we've done like I'd have to check four or five solo shows with him. I've worked with for a long time and did his first museum, you know, mini retro mid career retrospective. Esau Andrews. Um, I've never once other than just giving feedback when I visit a studio, like that's fucking blowing my mind. Have I ever been <laughs> like, Oh, you should paint a bunch of bunnies on ships because your collectors really like bunnies on <laughs> ships and stay away from, you know, creepy girls and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, everything that amazing gentleman paints finds a home. Right. You know, and uh, I love his imagination. I would never try to, uh, you know, tether it in any way. I just let it run free, run wild. And, you know, it's it's, it's always exciting. And that's the same with anyone that we work with. Um, we wouldn't work with them if we didn't trust them to, you know, kind of rule their own empire, so to speak. And we're just the lucky gatekeeper, so to speak, I guess you could say, that uh, allows people into the kingdom. When it comes to like installations and murals that you have accompanying a show, you know, especially back when we had more in-person events where, you know, that was a bigger part of the, the exhibition. How, how does that usually happen? Is that something usually you propose to an artist or do they come to you with an idea for that? I always let everyone know, like, as soon as I invite them that our space is their space to do with what they want. So like, if they want to paint the walls, if they want to, you know, put carpeting on all of our things like reader did or whatever they can dream up. <laughs> Let's make it happen. We, we just bought a, a a mapper for the new space, so we can bring works to life, um, which we're pretty nice. excited about. Um, you know, and we've got audio, video projecting capabilities, and this, that, and the other thing. We always let everybody know that they can do whatever they want. They can, you know, provide a soundtrack if there's a drink they want. Not everybody takes us up on it, but when they do, and they really kind of go to the next level, Joao Ruas comes to mind as somebody that always kind of takes things to the next level with every little facet of his shows, from sounds to lighting to, you know, directing of postcard layout and everything. I mean, I love his mind, um, but not everybody's that uber focused on the on the bigger vision. But when they are, it's exciting, and I always, you know, kind of. If something comes to mind, I mean, there's definitely some amazing installations that we've had in the past that, you know, we're definitely like, hey, have you ever thought of this? And then like a week later, they're like, oh, my God, this is what I'm going to do. And, and, you know, it like lit a fuse, I guess you could say, sure. or, uh, you know, crack, creaked open the door to uh, something maybe they didn't think I was going to be crazy enough to allow them to do. And, I'm, you know, like when Viveros brought in like, you know, three trunk loads full of dirt and, you know, <laughs> 
mannequins with TVs in their stomachs and all sorts of craziness to the space. I mean, that was like, I was like, huh, well, let's figure this out. And we figured out a way to contain it <laughs> and we did it. And the crazy story with that one is that, uh, we went and bought dirt at Home Depot, not really being, uh, gardening inclined folks ourselves we didn't realize that that dirt had a small bit of uh, manure in it and uh laid it down <laughs> and, and and went home you know we, we we put all the dirt in you know me and brian were like fuck that let's kill her sick went home i woke up the next morning at about 9 30 to three or four phone calls in a row i had missed the first two from the gentleman who occupied the upstairs portion of our building back on Washington, <laughs> saying that every member of his staff had to go home due to the toxic fumes of nitrous type <laughs> that were in his, that had, you know, basically wafted up over the course of the evening as uh, said uh, <laughs> dirt settled with uh, said compost inside of it. And, we, and I walked into the gallery and I was like, oh my God. So like we had to like kiss major ass up there, rented these two huge fans, aired it all out. This is Friday at like noon. Show opens the next day at six. Oh, so man. I pretty much backed up my car, lined it with like bags and just proceeded to start, you know, filling the trash cans that we had in the gallery with the dirt and going back and forth, back and forth for about two hours until I got it all out. Cause everybody else that worked at the gallery and my, my wife was busy that day. My two guys were busy. We had just spent all night installing. So I pretty much gave everybody the day off and Brian lives like an hour and a half away and he wasn't about to come and i didn't even want to alert him to this because uh, i didn't know how it was going to play out and he was so happy with the final product oh, wow. so i got all the dirt out of there went dumped it at a site where i found i could you know get rid of it and then proceeded to figure out where i could actually get real dirt you know just like just <laughs> dirt just fucking dirt just as i want some regular dirt which proved to be a, a huge undertaking really <laughs> yeah and finally this one guy at this one spot that i went to that i was told would have it he was like dude he's like ah he's like we're out right now this and another thing he's like i'll tell you where you should go and he directed me to this like abandoned like a uh, softball diamond out in the middle of like playa del rey in the middle of nowhere and um just instructed me to kind of go there and just break out a shovel and go for it so i did <laughs> And, uh, and I went back at about like, I think maybe five o'clock in the, in the early evening after a whole day of chasing dirt and then filling up my trunk again with dirt, hauled it all back into the gallery, laid it all back out flat, put the mannequins back in, made it all good, you know, lined up the dirt levels on the wall since the walls were already dirty. So I had to make sure that, you know, the dirt lined up or it would look really ass and the dirt was a cooler color and had a different feel and it just looked 10 times more dope. Nice. And I think by the time I got all done, it was like nine o'clock at night and I was just filthy and oh, covered wow. in sweat. And I remember uh, calling up Brian on FaceTime and he was just crying. I told him the story and um, he told his mom the story the next day. And this was like 10 years ago. And his mom, every time she sees me, she's like, the man who saved my boy's show. You know, <laughs> it's like his big show because that was his first like really breakout, crazy, insane show with us. And since then, he's just like, you know, we've done the book and. He's just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and he saw the space. He saw the new space for the first time last week, uh, actually just the other day and, uh, was just like blowing away. And, um, his shows bring out a grip of fucking people. His dirty land is strong. And, um, he was like, I can't fucking wait to rock this space, you know, and he's, he's going to be doing the show in fall 20, uh, fall 22 there. So, um, yeah, so there's a show that's already getting talked about in, in great glee and it's 19, 20 months away. Um, and he and I were already like, Oh, got to do a big sculpture here and fucking guy over there. And I mean, we were already brainstorming. That's awesome. Um, and you know, and I love when he gets excited. So yeah, it's going to be a good show. No, that's really cool. And that's amazing how stressful that day must have been for you. <laughs> oh, dude, fucking a. And that's actually talked about in the, uh, entry, like the little, uh, forward of his book that he asked me to write i talked about it in there and he he, he was just loves that it like got <laughs> i guess cemented for the ages so to speak uh because it was a uh, it was a uh, definitely a moment that i think a lot of people would have just cried and gave up <laughs> <laughs> right uh, yeah, yeah, was, can i throw your hands up and just like oh, i'm done <laughs> so you know you you've been at this for like a decade and a half now right and and one of the things we talked about you know last last year when we, we talked was, it was a lot of this was born out of yours and Sean's passion for collecting. And, and you started, you know, as, as collectors first. Um, and I know that you have sort of a veritable museum um, with all the work that you have in your house. <laughs> um, so like, 
do you still have that same like passion for collecting that really got you into this scene 16 years ago? Uh, uh, now that it's been a job for so long? I always still say that I'm a collector first. Um, and unfortunately, my email makes you know other galleries question selling to me sometimes, especially as our tastes have shifted a little bit to some artists on a little bigger trajectories. Um, I just had probably, a, and this blew my mind that she gave me the time, I probably like an hour and a half conversation with one of the head salespeople at Periton, which is a pretty late major, you know, space with, you know, galleries in probably four or five major countries and work with, you know, Ryden and Barry McGee and, you know, the upper echelon of folks. And um, we had collected an artist by the name of Otani Workshop when he was with Kaikai Kai Kiki, because I have a pretty good relationship with Murakami. He's bought some works from us. And at the same time, the gallery director I've become friendly with over a meeting in person at the last few complex cons. So we've got a pretty good in there with them. They know that we're, you know, collectors first, that we're not buying things to flip up at auction three to five years later and make the quick buck like a lot of people are doing right now. A lot of people wait three to five months now, it seems, which is a whole nother thing to get into. But um, anyways, so just the fact that she just took the time and, um, you know, I, I FaceTimed her and we walked through the collection and she was just blown away. And she's like, you got all these when they came on. I'm like, yeah, she's like, a lot of these people are crazy you now. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, but we always just bought what we like. And I'm like, and that's why I'm still wanting something from Otani. I know this is probably the last show that I'm going to be able to afford something from him by. But, you know, we have two works from him. We're planning to, you know, get a painting and another sculpture. And the fact that, you know, now I understand that it's a whole other plot, you know, level of playing field. I want you to also recognize that, you know, we're very serious in our collecting. We don't have children. You know, we're both getting to the age to where museums are going to start to pay attention to us. You know, once you kind of hit 60, then the collector committees will start to listen to you because you know the closer to death you are the more they know that they're closer to getting your collection so they want to talk to you um but we've done our due diligence you know i've done the mocha contemporaries board i've done some stuff with lacma you know we've done a lot of stuff with smaller institutions around the town and all the shows that we're you know doing now with museums across the states you know i make sure that as i get to know all the directors i let them know that hey you know our long-term goal is to be sure that this you know collection that we've amassed over the last 20 years and will continue to build for the next, you know, 10 to 20 is something that we want to stay together to represent, you know, our snapshot of what this, you know, was. And while it doesn't contain, you know, museum level massive pieces, at the same time, it does contain at least a small work from just about every major player in the game in some capacity or another in a very kind of Herb and Dorothy esque type curated fashion and anyone that's not familiar with that documentary should definitely look it up and enjoy it we've been uh you know i i i'm not full of myself i mean but other people have called us the herb and dorothy of the new contemporary world and it's it's it's, it's a huge honor to even have that come out of somebody's mouth and the few people that have said it i hold great weight and respect for so uh you know i don't feel weird you know sharing that or whatever but um it's what we're going for i mean we collect on a you know, a modest budget, you know, and at the same time, not much of the work is from our gallery. We don't cherry pick very often. And more often than not, we would try to wait to after the preview goes out. So the works do have a chance to get into the, you know, other collections and shine, you know, be, be exposed and whatnot. And now that we're starting to, you know, work on some mid-career retrospectives, like with East House Show, it was amazing to be able to, you know, reach back out to some people that we've put works into their collections and now, you know, afford them the possibility to have a work from their collection have the institutional you know nod and be shown in the museum because then that's pretty special for the collector too um and builds the relationship with the collector and the artist more so um that's all stuff that's definitely in the bucket list just more and more of that and at the same time just more building of our personal collection and our personal ties which at the same time i feel strengthens me as a gallerist and as a you know a representative of people's work because i get to learn how other people you know, kind of present things. Some of the things that she asked me and came at me were, were just so blue chip driven, but at the same time were really interesting, you know, to see the what went into just weighing out who was going to get a piece, you know, which is uh interesting. Yeah, yeah. And like uh no, so it's it's been it's been it's been pretty interesting. And at the same time we're like watching the auction market more uh the last few years than we ever have before. Um since a lot of our collecting tastes are getting to that level. Um, but at the same time, I can, you know, tell the writings on the wall for a, a number of the artists we work with in the next, you know, three to five years, definitely in the next decade, they're going to be at auction. 
So it behooves us now to, uh, you know, get our footing. Have you, have you found that, that your personal, like your, your shift in, in personal taste as far as art goes, uh, affects your creation at all through think space or are you able to kind of separate those two where you have more of an objective perspective on your creation side i mean everything that we buy we're not we're not buying anything out of you know assumption that it's going to go up in value so i mean that's definitely our, our collecting is still based on how we curate i mean we show what we love um and we buy what we love um if it happens to take off that's a plus but with that said i mean the whole notion of the move was you know directly influenced by you know some of our i guess bigger level collecting ourselves in the last few years just knowing that you know a stronger focus is always going to provide a stronger platform at the end of the day and is going to make you know patrons um be more inclined to uh you know believe the vision so to speak if we're not doing so many bigger group shows and so often and a lot of that like i said and i've been pretty vocal about was the whole notion of just making sure that everyone knew what the hell was going on with the movement and giving everybody a platform. And we've, we travel a lot. We do a lot of powwows, meet a, meet a lot of people. So at least we were able to give everybody a small little, you know, taste of them, you know, of, you know, exposure and give them out there and give them a chance. And hopefully they, you know, take that opportunity to run with it. I mean, not everybody's going to, you know, go from 100 artist group show to a solo show with us. And that's just the sheer reality of just not enough gallery right. space or time in the month so to, or in the, in a year. But, you know, um, as we, you know, decided to kind of take that next step with this new space, we also knew that uh, a next step was needed in terms of, you know, representation of our strong, strong base of artists that we've worked with for a long time and new artists that we were approaching that we knew um, needed to uh, to know that they weren't going to, you know, have so much, I guess, other, I hate to call the group shows noise, but I've had so many people call them that. I'm going to just go with that. I mean, just because it does take a lot of attention away from whatever main show we are doing at the time when all of a sudden we're having to present and promote and market, you know, upwards of a hundred artists in a show. And as I get older, I'm also, uh, you know, very well aware of, uh, you know, being realistic of my health and my boundaries and not, uh, trying to run around like a 20 year old too. And I think it's just come, come a time with, uh, where a lot of our artists that we've worked really hard over the last, uh, five to 10 years, especially, especially the last five to grow and develop and, you know, do bigger shows with the museums and, uh, fairs and things of that nature that, uh, we didn't want them to ever feel the need, uh, to think about going anywhere else that we wanted to reaffirm our, uh, commitment and dedication to their growth and their, uh, long-term development. And I think with this new space and our, uh, new programming, we're going to do just that. Nice. Yeah. And so we, we talked a lot about some of uh, 2020 and, you know, the bad and good aspects of, of it. Um, mostly bad, but the way you guys reacted was good. Um, so so I want to talk about what you have coming up uh, in 2021. Um, and, and I guess first off, you have, um, you know, at the point where this show comes out, uh, the end of this week will be your first show in 2021. Uh, Aloha, Mr. Han, which I guess opens on January 9th. So what can you tell me about that that group show? Yeah, that that group show um came about um we just we originally had kind of taken January off um figuring we were going to need it to settle from the move. And uh as things got uh, a little bit more progressed, um we could tell that we were going to be ahead of the game and uh we were like, "Well, hell, man, let's start, let's put together a pretty pretty killer lineup of uh, you know, who we're really looking to to build long term, who's on the program for 21 and 22." And um, at the same time, make it a sick group show, but make it like a, a real who's who of our uh, core roster. And um, at the same time, introduce some new new people coming up that have big shows later in the year. And um, we're pretty excited with um, what we put together. I've had a few people ask where the name came from. Uh, I noticed a bit of a trend in the last two or three years of just silly movie quotes being show titles. I always thought it was kind of funny. I was like, I'll keep it in mind. And when this show came about, a lot of our group shows will always have a really strong one word, kind of like powerful, you know, like, like Nexus or, you know, things like that. Just like things that we just are, you know, we just want to kind of have like a strong marketing, you know, foundation to work with. And it's not too, I guess, uh, it, it, it doesn't direct things too much in terms of, you know, what do you expect for the show? It's just more like a statement, almost title. Um, 
But with this one, with the new space being so kind of proper and next level, we we still wanted people to know that our vibe is fun. And um, Spicoli to me is the ultimate kind of fuck it all type dude. And um, I had just watched it uh, on rerun on some uh, cable show like maybe two, three days prior. And I always crack up at that line. And um, I was like, fuck it, man. Let's just do that. And we'll pull up some, you know, cheesy, like, you know, stills of him for the promotion and have some fun with it. And the artists have loved it. And it's just, you know, it's just showing a good vibe. And um, we've got about, I don't know, I think about like maybe uh, just shy of 40 artists in the show, which is a good core of our fam. And they're all doing one or two new works each. And um, a lot of them on the bigger scale to really take advantage of the new space. And um, we're super excited. Um, it's going to be a big launch. You know, it's it sucks that we're still going to have to contend with COVID. Hopefully people aren't complete morons over the holidays and traveling too much. But it seems like we're already hearing from the news that's going to be the case. So hopefully uh, things don't go further down to shitter to where we can't even have people through. That would be a total bummer. Um, we're hoping we can still do visits. We're open. You know, things don't. I mean, but we're at like zero capacity here at ICUs in uh, Southern California. So I don't have a whole lot of hope and I'm retaining hope, but regardless, we're going to be balls out with the, the virtual uh, online stuff for the show for sure. Um, a lot of the artists are going to be doing uh, fun little uh, video things with us and whatnot. Um, some of the works, I, I'd say 98% of the works in, I'm only waiting on a couple pieces right now from some, some local artists. Everything is just above par like awesome work f from the artists like just next level shit um and it's introducing um a number of people that uh we'll be doing bigger shows with um in the year ahead that we haven't really done much with in the past like i'm on boy from spain who's just a killer killer uh talent um uh jack sure uh who are going to be doing a big solo show with in june um that a lot of people are excited about right now he's been a uh, showing for a number of years and his uh new direction that he's kind of uh grown into in the last year is just uh exciting and uh we're super excited for that uh jeremy gaddis is going to be debuting some graphite works on paper uh in a gallery setting which he's never done before oh nice and um we're super excited about that i've been seeing him post a lot of those recently yeah yeah those are all works that are going to be for a big show that we're working on in a couple of years with him but um He's just driving his fan base crazy. So I was like, well, why don't you? I'm like, just let a couple go early. And he had a couple that didn't fit with the vibe of the show as a whole that were just of uh, bird carcasses, um, recently departed birds. And uh, they're, they're, they're super special. And then Julia Naya Cabending from uh, Spain that does the uh, 18th and 19th century masterworks on the streets, frame and all in a trompe kind of three-dimensional fashion. Um, and has recently, you know, started doing gallery shows and found pieces of cardboard and debris that he finds at the sites of his, uh, public works, um, and recreating the same vibe. We're excited to have him, um, a new artist from Brazil, Lucas Lobo, which, uh, we just got the works in yesterday for the first time and saw him in person. And, uh, every one of us was just like freaking the fuck out They're They're insane. They're insane. This guy's brain is like on. 14 i mean i don't even know what, i don't even know what's happening and i'm not fluent in spanish so i can't make out a lot of it which i can only imagine will just up the ante of uh enjoyment uh once i decipher some of it with him and kind of go through his process of what he's saying and stuff where we've, we've got to talk next week but um he's a guy that's just constantly kind of tagged me over the last few years on instagram and um i look at everybody that tags me i really do um granted a lot of it doesn't excite me and that but i'll still look um but every time i looked at this guy i was just like man what is he on this shit's insane and it just got it got more and more dense and more and more layered and his world grew and then once covid hit he started like a whole nother level of influence came into it that just blew my mind and uh when i hit him up i think i uh I think I made his millennium, which was really special. Um, he didn't think anyone was following. He's, he's got a small following. He's not the best at really kind of, I, it, it, I, I just think we're going to do a lot of good for him. I'm excited. Um, he, he's a very, uh, quiet guy. And I think this is going to be huge for him. Um, what else is in the show? That's going to be kind of exciting. Um, more, more new work from Stom 500 out of Italy, who we're really excited about. Um, our first big showing with, uh, Victoria Casanova, 
who's a local artist who we just did a powwow antelope valley with um her new works are uh phenomenal like just like super super like deep i think is the best way i can describe them and i just i just love her work uh, i think she's a an amazing spirit um so there's a lot of stuff coming up and then uh as we go into february um we're doing our first big uh show with uh robbie duantono um from the philippines that people are just like that's definitely our probably most hotly anticipated show and uh in a minute nice um people are super excited and then we're gonna have dulk out in new york city with our friends at spoke art that we're uh curating um he's also doing um the la fava festival that's coming up in spain where a huge sculpture of his will be burnt in this in the town center with oh, wow. a lot of others that in years past uh isif just did it and before that uh uh, Akuda and uh, Pichiavo have done it, so it's a it's a pretty prestigious thing in Spain to to take part on. And then um, in March we're bringing over and doing the uh, U.S. debut of uh, Nigerian artist uh, Ken Nwadagabo, which is going to be amazing. Um, and Georgico are up right after that with their first big show and debuting a new sculpture, and um, that show is going to be epic. And then uh, Milo from uh, Italy is coming over, which will be pretty amazing um his first big u.s solo show he's just been on a complete mural terror these uh this past year um we're doing a big uh, museum solo show with julio anaya cabending that i mentioned earlier um jack sure is going to have his debut big so show with us um low knots is coming back from croatia looking forward to that uh tron to win is going to have her first show with us in a while um excited about that um hunts lou's got a big show coming up kayla mahaffey will have her biggest show to date in september uh doing a museum show at the mesa museum with wiley wallace and his old town he's really excited about that um cinta vidal is going to be doing a huge solo um at the lancaster museum in the uh in the fall debuting um sculptural works of her uh floating houses that are going to be very special um that's awesome we're curating a show at a uh, vertical gallery in the fall in chicago uh hilda palafox uh pony will be back and um we're gonna be doing the debut uh u.s show from uh boris anji out of ken maroon his work is epic i am fucking super stoked to debut him and um oscar joyo from chicago is going to be having his first big show with us in the fall uh, we're bringing over a door and Pez to graffiti legends, street art legends, um, to do a big show. Um, I'm on boy. will have his first big solo with us. And, uh, and then we've got that big museum show at the end of the year in the Midwest that I mentioned that, uh, I'm going to keep under tabs for now with the, with the, uh, with an artist from the Midwest. That's just going to be a uh, baller. So we're excited. We've got a big year ahead. Um, it's and a, a lot year. of, uh, a lot of really crazy kind of next level, really special editions planned um uh, which was another part of the the new space was making sure that we could really do uh things on a next level and not just be contained to g clays but do like some really cool things and have space for them we've got some new book projects coming up that'll uh if they're not going to be out by the end of the year they'll be out in like spring 22 but they'll be you know being worked on all of 2021 um so they're ready and um no, it, it just uh, super stoked. Um, we've got figures, like actual like sculptural figure editions coming out with uh, Georgico, with Kayla Mahaffey, uh, with Super A, um, just a lot of uh, killer, killer, killer stuff cooking right now. Um, we're excited. Awesome. Yeah, that's a big year for you guys, man. Yeah, we're excited. That's awesome. So, um, you know, remind folks where they can find you online so they can stay plugged into all this. Yeah, we're at thinkspaceprojects.com. Um, we're on all the social nets. There's links to all of them there, including our YouTube channel and our blog, sourharvest.com. Um, sign up to our newsletter. Pops up when you go to the site. We send out an email. Uh, depends on what we got going on. Usually not more than once a week. We try not to be too annoying to your inbox. And that's really the best spot to keep tabs on us. That gets you all of our show previews in advance. We usually send out a show preview the Monday before every show opening so if you're a collector you get a chance to check them out before uh the general public does um usually by the time you see things on instagram it's already too late and i try to impress that upon people um we we definitely like the newsletter to be uh you know the home base for where people you know get the info first and you know a lot of people you know 
a big show will be announced in January that's going to happen in November. And if you were on the newsletter or pay attention to our website, you know that. But then, you know, once you start seeing it two, three weeks out on Instagram and get in touch with me, it's usually too late because I've already had so many people excited by, you know, that are, you know, on top of things. That's never a bad thing. That just means that's helping to set up the next show. And we always give everybody the time of day and talk them through the process and stuff like that just because, um, you know, that's how you keep things growing and building. Well, it's definitely worth it. I, I've, again, on the collector side of things, I've always appreciated your newsletter and that you, I, I never felt like it's um, too much communication, I, I, but I feel like it's more than a lot of galleries do, like in the sense that I don't have to go ask you for one specific show preview. Like you're sending them out to anybody that registers to your newsletter. Um, and it's, it's like, I don't have to jump through a bunch of hurdles to know what you're doing, you know? which I, I feel is different in other, you know, kind of swaths of the, the community. So I, I definitely encourage anybody that's listening to sign up for the newsletter. That's definitely the best way to kind of keep up with, with what think space is doing and what you guys got going on. Thanks man. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's something we've always felt pretty strongly about. Um, and that I've had a lot of discussions with a lot of various art dealers over the years, you know, that, you know, some of them think we take the exclusivity out of things and I laugh and I'm like, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Right. right. You know, and, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. Cause I hate to have to jump through hurdles. I mean, like earlier when I mentioned with Periton, even though I got a kick out of it, it was still kind of like, Jesus Christ, I just want to buy a piece. Um, but I understand when you're dealing with an, you know, somebody that's got that level of collector base from so many different, you know, spaces around the world, not to mention, you know, artists that reach that level of demand. So it's better to make sure that they go somewhere that's not going to flip them. I get it. You know, I mean, we're, we're, we're starting to enter that realm with a number of artists we work with ourselves and, you know, making sure that it's just not a first come first serve, you know, basis. You have to, I mean, only sending the preview out to people that ask for it is, you know, assuming everybody that, you know, has bought a piece from you over the you know 15 years you've been around is paying attention, which not everybody can because everybody has lives and kids and shit going on. So they might miss it. And at the same time, they might not be that inclined by the one or two, let's say pre-advanced marketing image business, but then fall in love with another piece. You know, I mean, our open click to rate is around 26 to 30% on a preview, which is pretty big numbers from what I understand from asking around and stuff. Cause everyone's just curious, you know? And, um, I I'd say at least once or twice every show, the email starts out with, I didn't think I was going to get anything from this show. I didn't think I was, this artist was on my radar, but holy shit, I see what you see in them now. And, you know, I fucking love this. I got to have this piece. And that's awesome. And that wouldn't have happened if I didn't, you know, send it out there wide. And, you know, some people will be like, oh, you're taking away the surprise for people that want to come see the show. And it's like, well, your average person that wants to come see the show doesn't have to click on the link. Exactly. Right. It's like the age old thing with like music. It's like, if you don't like the music, don't fucking listen to it. Don't make me put a label on it because you're afraid your kid's going to, you know, go out and burn churches down if he listens to some metal music or whatever it's like <laughs> it's almost the same thing like just just let it be out there let everybody check it out and and the, the same notion with like the live things and our video tours and everything like that just making everything as public as you can be i mean uh i've i've gone to check out video tours at other galleries and you have to like sign in and get you know subscribe to their newsletter which hey, is a cool tactic i'll give them that but it's just like another step. Whereas we just want people to be able to check stuff out. And that's why we put everything like that up on our blog too. So it's just like right there for everybody to check out and, you know, easy access, like a portal. And, and I, I, I like being surprised by artists. Like if, if I'm, yeah. if I'm required to ask somebody for a preview, I may not ask for all the previews that I could potentially end up liking and not even know it, you know, kind of like you said, you know, you, you have people stumble upon new work that they ne- didn't even think going in that they would be into, but they are, you know. And the fact that we put pricing blows a lot of people's minds, but to me that to, to have to follow up and do that, like, am I worthy <laughs> or, or like what, what Google search are going to do on you to see what pricing they give you since a lot of galleries have strata of pricing for, you know, people like what might be 4,000 for you might be 6,000 to the guy that walks in with nicer shoes like an hour later. <laughs> um, that's why the pricing is not listed. That's why they do that. I mean, if you read the books about the art market, which are out there and they're not bullshit, it's what happens. You know, and then, you know, I mean, we've had it happen a couple times over the years where an artist has moved on and their new gallery will be like, can you take down their pricing history, please? I'm like, why are your fucking patrons too stupid to realize that that's how the art world works? I want to see that somebody was maybe $500 four years ago and now they're 5000 That's awesome. You know, but some people 
get freaked out about showing that, you know, or even showing the current pricing because then they can't do the, you know, the, the cup dance. Like, which price do you get <laughs> under these three cups? You know, it's like, let me see which one you get. Oh, you got the nice car. You get the big price. But that's how the art world works. The blue chip world works. I mean, it's heavily documented in film and book. Well, I've always appreciated the transparency. So, no, that's what we aim for, just to make sure everybody just feels comfortable. You know, you're not feeling like you're, I don't know, get, getting a rectal exam to buy a piece of work, so to speak. <laughs> you know, <It> just, <laughs> just make just making enjoyable and make sure that people, you know, know that we love art as much as they do. You know, that's why we do it. That's what it's all about. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for, for coming on the show again, man. I, I hope we can keep doing these wrap ups each year and, and just, you know, thank you again for all the support you've shown to me and for the show. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for the love. And, uh, let's hope that, uh, when we meet again, there's not, uh, as much crap that's gone down. Let's hope it's been a, a more prosperous year for us all. That's, uh, I think the best way to end this. That's, uh, onward and upward in 2021 for everybody. So that's it for this special 2020 year in wrap up. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Andrew. It was interesting to take a look back over the last year and reflect on not only all of the events that, you know, affected all of us, but also how Andrew and Think Space reacted to those events. Uh, and like I said to him, I, I have an enormous amount of respect for how he reacted and responded to all of these things. Um, it, it not only reaffirmed my appreciation for, for him and for the Think Space crew, but it made me want to support them even more. Um, you know, hard times and difficult, harrowing events can really reveal the true nature of a person at their rawest. And I truly feel like they really shined in the wake of everything and showed the world not only what great gallerists and supporters of the arts that they are, but also what incredible people they are as well. Their 2021 lineup looks super impressive. I'm excited for many of the exhibitions that Andrew listed off. I actually have a couple of those artists lined up for chats on this show over the next couple months. And their 2021 program kicks off proper the Saturday after this show should be debuting, uh, January 9th, with the opening of their group show, Aloha Mr. Hand, featuring one or two works from several of the members of their core roster. Uh, reach out to the gallery for a preview of that show, and also be sure to subscribe to their newsletter if you haven't already. Uh, like we talked about there at the end, it's by far the best way to stay up to speed with what they have going on. So thanks again to Andrew for joining me today, and thank you for checking out the show. I'm truly grateful for your support. Seriously though, with the year closing out, I can't thank you all enough for tuning in and supporting me in the show. One big way you could help out if you're really enjoying the show would be to review it on Apple Podcasts. And of course, you know, just sharing it with your friends. As always, you can contact me through my website at artaffairspodcast.com or on Instagram at artaffairspodcast. So until next time, be good to yourself and be good to each other.